Searching for treasure with my own. 
Well, hello, everybody. Uh, Alyssa's not here tonight. She, uh, I don't know, man. She's, uh, you know, she's doing her thing. Alan Aguirre with your Chameleon Church Monday night gathering. Uh, we do this on Monday nights. Every once in a What's going on with my hat? Is my head just crooked? Is, I don't know what's going on. And um, we are going through the Feasts Unlocked. We're going through this book right now. It's right here. And we are, I think, in Chapter 5, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, the Omer Count, 2 of 4. Yep, yep, yep. That is what's going on. Session 18. Everybody ready? We good? It's like we, got, we need a flight plan, you know, one of those flight checks, you know, pushing all the buttons and ground control to major Tom. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yep, 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 yep. Okay. Um, Father. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Father. Hey. It's Monday. Yeah, it is. It's Monday. Did you watch Two Minute Warning this morning? I, I don't know how long I was going, and I was muted. And then I'm like, oh, unmute. You guys don't know, huh? Because none of you watch it. It's Monday. That's right. It's Monday. All right. Here we go. You guys ready? Raise your hand. Everyone's good to go. All right. Here we go. Woo! Resurrection Sunday. So this book came out in 2018. That's like six years ago. And this is the first time we've been through it. And we started it when we started it. And who knew? I didn't know. Now, by the time we got to this part, Resurrection Sunday, it would be like the day after that whole goofy thing that happened over the weekend. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, did you, um, if, if you're a, if you help, if you, if you give to this ministry, then you watched the uh, the um, prophetic points that my wife and I did on Saturday. If you don't give to this ministry, then you didn't watch the prophetic points. My daughter was texting us last night. Oh my God, what are you guys doing? The first eight minutes are like pure comedy, and, it, and I'm like, oh my gosh. So I went back and looked at like the first four, five, six minutes. It's pure comedy, and I'm like, and my wife's like, this isn't why people are watching. This is not. This is this isn't why they're here for. I'm like, some of them are. Some of you are actually there to, <clears throat> to watch that. Anyway, yeah. All right, let's um, let's do this thing. You guys ready? Let's go. Thank you, Father. Appreciate what you do for us and how you do it for us. All right. Yesterday is what they were, yesterday is what Romanized Western Christianity called Resurrection Sunday. That was yesterday. And we are actually going to talk about it today. So then, what about this Resurrection Sunday sunrise service stuff? Again, the resurrection, Feast of First Fruits, is not a Sabbath, nor did it occur on Sunday morning, as we have already explained with the biblical text. Roman Catholicism, as we have already seen, presumed the authority to change the narrative and taught that Messiah died on a Friday and rose early on a Sunday morn. We have clearly shown the error of that idea with the actual biblical narratives and timelines. Let me show you how and what does observe a sunrise service in Scripture. In the, ne- in the sixth month, While Ezekiel sat in his house with the elders of Judah during their Babylonian captivity, Ezekiel states in chapter 8 of his book that the hand of Adonai fell upon him. A form that appeared as a man stood before him, and below the waist of this form was fire, and above the waist of this form was what looked like bright, gleaming metal. Oh, man. This form reached out with what looked like the form of a hand and grabbed Ezekiel by a lock of his head. Potentially dreadlocks, right? I mean, a lock of his head means that the... Anyway. It's not a braid. It's a lock of his head. This is not a lock of hair. 
But it's, it's, is it a clump of hair? I'm, I always go with the whole dreadlock thing. All right. So what looks like a hand from this fire metal gleaming thing reached out with what looked like the form of a hand and grabbed Ezekiel by a lock of his head. The Spirit of God lifted Ezekiel up between heaven and earth, and he describes being taken to Jerusalem by visions of God. Ezekiel is, Ezekiel is taken and shown the north face of the inner court's gateway where the image of jealousy that provokes jealousy was seated. The glory of God that Ezekiel had previously seen was also there and instructed Ezekiel to look north. Ezekiel sees the image of jealousy at the entrance north of the altar gate and is asked if he could see what was being done by the house of Israel, the abominations that were taking place and the acts that were driving the glory of God far away from his very own sanctuary. We don't really know, I don't know, what this image of jealousy is or what it looks like. What, but what we do know is that it's not a good thing. God is literally being driven away, driven out of his own sanctuary by what is being done by the house of Israel, the abominations that were taking place and the acts that they were doing. Ezekiel is then taken to the entrance of the court where he sees a hole in the wall. He is then instructed to dig. Ezekiel begins digging at the hole in the wall, revealing an entrance. Again, Ezekiel is instructed, and he goes in and witnesses the vile abominations taking place and committed there. Ezekiel obeys, and he sees engraved on all the walls every form of creeping things and low, loathsome beasts, along with all of Israel's idols. Standing before these demonic engravings are 70 elders how many elders did Moses have in the uh, desert? Seventy. That's right. Well, there's 70 elders of the house of Israel right here. And they're in incense smoke. There are people out there that would literally want us to believe that, that it's marijuana smoke. There are people out there that teach that. I don't know. I'm going to say no, but some people believe that. Seventy elders of the house of Israel in incense smoke that is emitting from the censers they are all holding. The glory of God asks Ezekiel, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are doing secretly, worshiping each in their dark room of images? I tried telling myself, not to get upset or emotional or whatever while we read this part, but man, these are the elders of Israel, mind you. They're not just some people. If you hear all that noise upstairs, I've got four grandchildren upstairs doing who knows what. The elders were convinced that Adonai couldn't, wouldn't, or didn't see them and that he had forsaken the land. Ezekiel is taken again, but this right if, if God did forsake the land, this is not what you should be doing to try to bring his presence back. Do you know what I right? No. You should be doing the exact stinking opposite. Ezekiel is taken again, but this time to the north gate of the temple, where women were weeping for Tammuz. There are women located at the north gate of the temple weeping for Tammuz, worshiping a pagan god. This Sumerian god of food and vegetation, an annual life-death-rebirth deity, has a parallel consort in the goddess Ishtar that is worshipped beginning with the summer solstice with a time of mourning, weeping. And he brought me into the inner court of the house of Adonai, and behold, at the entrance of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of Adonai and their faces toward the east, worshiping the sun toward the east. That's not sunset. That's sunrise. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? 
Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations that they commit here? That they should fill the land with violence and provoke me still further to anger? I know some leadership right now that are filling the land with violence and provoking God to anger. Behold, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore I will act in wrath. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. In verses 3 and 5 of Ezekiel 8, you'll see that in the north entrance of the inner courtyard gate stood the, not an, but the idol that arouses God's jealousy and that provokes his zealous indignation. With the exception of the sun and Tammuz, Ezekiel doesn't name these actual objects of worship seen in the temple. We know that Ahaz, under the influence of the Assyrian king, had removed the brazen altar in the temple to make room for an idolatrous idolatrous altar in the temple itself, and that Manasseh did the same. You want to bring guilt? You want to bring God's wrath and condemnation on the people? As a leader, do that. Ezekiel doesn't say that God is jealous of Tammuz or of all the idols of the house of Israel found in the inner court or the solar worship. So why this one? An interpretation offered by Margaret O'Dell might be more fitting in the context of Ezekiel. O'Dell suggests that this is a votive statue and argues that the sacrifices made at the statue are the problem. In her view, the sacrifices most likely to raise the angst of Yahweh and are our child's sacrifices. Odell's argument fits to some extent with Ezekiel's concerns about child sacrifice elsewhere in the text. Child sacrifice was as repugnant to Ezekiel as it is to us. But Mark S. Smith says in the Early History of God, page 172, that child sacrifice was Judean practice in the 7th century and that it was performed in the name of Yahweh as well as other gods. We know they gave their children to Molech. How do you get to that point where as a people you give your children as an offering to Molech, to a pagan deity, a Canaanite deity. In the inner court of the temple, the house of Adonai, at the entrance, were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of Adonai and their faces toward the east, worshiping the sun toward the east. Further study will show that this sun worship occurred predominantly at sunrise. Here's your sunrise service. And that's a lot of perversion occurring all at the same time in the temple and its adjacent courts. You should also know that some scholars believe that the Catholic Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem is built over a cave that was originally a shrine to Tammuz. All right. Continuing in Ezekiel 9, we find what happens to these idolaters. Six men. Six men with weapons of slaughter in their hands wait. They're waiting for the one clothed in linen with a tattoo machine around his waist to tattoo those in the city that sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in Jerusalem. As they're being marked by the one clothed in linen, these six men with weapons of slaughter go about striking and killing old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, starting at the sanctuary while sparing only those with the mark, the tattoo, on their foreheads. They begin the slaughter with the 70 elders found in chapter 8. In chapter 10, the glory of Adonai is forced to leave the temple. In the same way that these elders in Ezekiel were convinced that Adonai couldn't, wouldn't, or didn't see them, the Romanized Western Church would have us all believe that because of Jesus, this new covenant, 
the perversions we have committed and continue to commit against God's word, Jesus incarnate, and his commandments, Torah, as Christians, will go unpunished. Because, you see, Jesus has become our license for lawlessness. It doesn't work that way. Jesus and his covenants only work with our volunteered repentance, and no one is repenting of these perversions, just like Israel. I've posted the following a couple, two or three times since I've written it, and it really triggers Christians. They don't like this. The, rex- the resurrection of my Messiah did not, occur, did not occur on the sunrise of a Sunday morn to be observed with colored eggs that represent the goddess of fertility with an abominable meal of swine on a false Sabbath in commemoration of a demonic deity. The resurrection of my Messiah occurred on the Feast of First Fruits, the Saturday night after the weekly Sabbath following Passover during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as instructed by God through Moses and in accordance with the whole counsel of Scripture. Choose you this day whom you will serve and by whom you'll be represented. So this goofy thing just happened this weekend. And our numbers are really small. I, I was going to bring this up tomorrow. We, we saw posts of people doing Passover on Thursday night because it's before Good Friday when he's going to be crucified. And they were talking about, oh, it's our first Passover. And it was on Thursday night, and we're just like, oh, my God. That's when, uh, what is it, when you know, when you know too much and you, to make yourself dangerous? It's, it's just goofy. I mean, I understand why they would do it, because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know. They don't know. But, Yeah. I actually wanted to take a break here simply because that stuff really upsets me. What we just read really upsets me. It just gets me all riled up. It gets me very angry and upset, and it's like Phineas, you know? I just want to go around taking care of business. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay. All right. Foo by you. All right. All right. So, Saturday after Shabbat, following Passover, within Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right. Here we go. The principle of first fruits in chapter two. I mentioned the cycles. I mentioned how the feasts are synonymous with God's agricultural calendar, the importance of their cyclical order, and how we find these cyclical rhythms weekly Shabbat, monthly, Rosh Kodesh, and yearly the feasts. We discuss how these cycles take us from harvest, Passover and first fruits, to harvest, Feast of Weeks, toward increase, Shavuot, Pentecost, culminating with the year end harvest gathering of the Feast of Ingathering all with an aspect of first fruits along the way. We could say that first fruits is the lifestyle, lifestyle indicative to kingdom living. Did you hear that? First fruits is a lifestyle indicative to kingdom living on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because, as, you, as we'll see, it's, it's the giving of your best. It's the giving of your choice. It's the giving of your increase. You know, and the larger the increase, well, the larger you give, the, the more the increase. It's this amazing cyclical, right? That's kingdom living on earth as it is in heaven. I also stated that this ever forward yearly momentum of further up and further in speaks to our lifestyle participation 
our growth and understanding the wisdom of applying this kingdom lifestyle through our worship of giving and the sowing into of into of first fruits will reap provision and blessing in our lives. First fruits is spiritual in nature, intended to produce a kingdom mindset in us, just as Torah is spiritual in nature, exposing sin, cultivating obedience, and in turn intended to produce reap kingdom blessings, fruit in our lives. This act of honoring God with the first of what you receive is all about his cyclical rhythm of increased birth out of your obedience to his word. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you, and I am banking on that. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in Adonai with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all, that's the only part Christians know. They don't know what came before that or after that. Well, except for this one. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Adonai and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor Adonai with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Did you see the formula? Don't forget his teachings, Torah. Keep his commandments, Torah. Bind and write steadfast love and faithfulness around your neck and on your heart. Trust and not deny with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear Adonai. Turn away from evil. Honor Adonai with your wealth and with your first fruits. This cyclical rhythm from harvest to harvest, this first fruits lifestyle of blessing and provision, continues from the feast of first fruits all the way to our increase with the start of the counting of the Omer, the feast of weeks, the 49 day countdown to the wheat harvest, festival of Shavuot. Woohoo! All right, the counting of the Omer, the feast of weeks. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. So right about now, some of you might be thinking that a 40-some-odd day count around springtime and the resurrection of Jesus sounds familiar, and it should. Many in the Romanized Western Church observe as a holy time a similar springtime countdown. This traditional countdown, instead of counting 49 days plus one from Passover, does the exact opposite. There's, a, there's your clue right there. From the scriptural instruction of the Omer count and counts 40 days, instead of 49, toward Passover's general direction to a man-made tradition known as Easter's. I, I, I was going to take a clip from, from Nacho Libre where the guy says, Easter's. Don't you know I've been, I've had diarrhea since Easter's? I don't know. I'm, it's, a, it's really funny. And I was going to do that, but I didn't. Probably good that I didn't, right? Easter's. Essentially, the Romanized Western Church's official replacement for Passover. Do I have a, yay, I should have some claps. I'm sure I do somewhere. Hold on. This stuff is just <laughs> stupid. Yay. Really cool. Replacement theology. All right. This observance, the counting toward Easter's, and Easter's itself have nothing more than man-made religious traditions to substantiate them. But it does beg the question, why, if we already have a scriptural instruction from God himself to count 49 days plus one following Passover, why would we substitute that with a 40-day count leading up to? Get the idea? The institution that outlawed the scriptural Sabbath and determined that our faith would observe a man-made day instead 
This same institution that outlawed this, you should be here. John, na 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 na, institutionalized by uh, yeah. That's you should be hearing that in the background. I am. This same institution that outlawed and replaced God's covenant Passover with a man-made tradition that declared Passover and the eating of unleavened bread anathema. This institution decided to do the exact opposite of the scriptural instruction. And they told everyone that the early church fathers learned this practice they call Lent from the original disciples. <laughs> can you see? <laughs> can you see the twelve disciples doing this? I just, I just can't. <sighs> okay, the festival of which we read in church history under the name of Easter's in the 3rd and 4th centuries, was quite a different festival from that now observed in the Romish church, and at that time was not known by any such names as Easter's. That festival, Passover, it was Pesach, was not adulterous, and it was preceded by no Lent. It ought to be known, said uh, Cassinius, the monk of Marsilis, writing in the 5th century and contrasting the primitive New Testament church with the church of his day, that the observance of the 40 days had no existence so long as the perfection of that primitive church remained inviolate. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Shrove Tuesday. I think that's how you say it, or Mardi Gras, as it is commonly known, literally means Fat Tuesday in French, also known as Pancake Tuesday in England, and is associated with the Roman Catholic custom of Lent, first mentioned in the fifth canon of the Council of Nicaea, or Nicaea. The idea behind Mardi Gras, or carnival celebrations, is that people overindulge before giving up something for Lent, which begins the following day with Ash Wednesday. All right, did you hear that? Send your little brains out, and then you can repent. Lent is the 40-day count from Ash Wednesday to Easter. Easter's, sorry. Lent is a time of penance, fasting, and abstinence. From Ash Wednesday to Easter, many solemnly mark their foreheads with ash, fasting or abstaining from certain foods or physical pleasures for four, after they did all, all of them, uh, for 40 days to prepare them for Easter. I'm sorry, you'll find none of that in the Bible. The real aim of Lent is, above all else, to prepare men for the celebration of the death and resurrection of Christ. The better the preparation, the more effective the celebration will be. One can effectively relive the mystery of only with purified mind and heart. The purpose of Lent is to provide that purification by weaning men from sin and selfishness through self-denial and prayer by creating in them the desire to do God's will and to make his kingdom come by making it come first of all in their hearts. I'm going to repeat that because you need to take some little points here. The real aim of Lent is above all else to prepare men for the celebration of the death and resurrection of Christ. The better the preparation, the more effective the celebration will be. One can effectively relive the mystery death and resurrection, only, and re death and, and, and resurrection of Messiah, only with purified mind and heart. The purpose of Lent is to provide that purification by weaning men from sin and selfishness, selfishness through self-denial and prayer, by creating in them the desire to do God's will and to make his kingdom come, by making it come first of all in their heart. Sounds good. It seems sincere, but it has absolutely nothing to do with anything other than man-made religious tradition and the usurping of Scripture. But wait, doesn't basic Christian belief tell us that there's nothing we can do by works to purify our hearts and minds? that no number of works can wean us from sin, that acts of self-denial can't provide us with purification, a desire to do God's will or make his kingdom come? Yeah, they do tell us that. And it begs the other and obvious question. Why not just 
do what God actually instructed if you're going to bother at all. Well, that answer should be perfectly clear. This Lent stuff isn't Jewish. Coming from the Anglo-Saxon lecten, meaning spring, Lent originated in the ancient Babylonian mystery religion. Yeah. I, I need that Tom Slick. Yeah. The 40 days abstinence of Lent was directly borrowed from the worshippers of the Babylonian goddess. Oh, what goddess? Ishtar? Babylonian goddess is Ishtar. Astra. Yeah. Among the pagans, this Lent seems to have been an indispensable preliminary to the great annual festival in commemoration of the death and resurrection of Tammuz. There's that name again. Tammuz was also known as the Babylonian Messiah. Simply put, this is just another religious counterfeit based on things in which God forbids us to participate. The Feast of Tammuz was usually celebrated in June. Oh, do you know what else is done in June? Yeah, Pride Month. Also called the Month of Tammuz, right? Isn't Pride Month in June? Yeah, Jonathan Connick talks a lot about, yeah. Also called the Month of Tammuz. Lent was the 40-day count before the Feast of Easter, celebrated by alternate weeping and rejoicing. So why the embracing of yet another obvious pagan exercise? For the same reasons they did anything. Or, to conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity. Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christian and pagan festivals amalgamated. And, by a complicated but skillful adjustment of the calendar, it was found no difficult matter, in general, to get paganism and Christianity now far sunk in idolatry, in this as in so many other things, to shake hands. Womp. Man, oh man. All right, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be right back. I, you, you need to get yourself a nice stiff drink after that one, right? I'm sure some of you do. It's insane. <laughs> What am I pushing? I'm pushing the wrong button, people. Hold on one second. Oh, I know why. Hey. Hey. What is up? 
thanks for reminding us of that Ezekiel 8 stuff, man. If people would read that, oh my gosh. It, it's just so disturbing. <laughs> it's so disturbing what we just read. It's crazy. You know? I agree. And I like your little Easter's. Easter's. I mean, I, I, it's natural Libre. It's just, it's just. I love, I love how important this message is and how we have like half the amount of people that I know of here. It's just always telling, right? I mean, this is so important because this permeates the, the majority of faith, the majority of people of faith, this permeates their lives. You know, as subtle as it is, I mean, this is like, oh, okay, this is, but if this is actively going on in their lives as part of their faith profile, it's going to like, spread like remember the blob remember who remembers watching the blob remember that thing just kept growing <laughs> same idea oh my gosh all right jason how the heck are you all right i'm sorry doug are you done uh sort of <laughs> well don't leave i'm sure you have more for later <laughs> yeah no that was really rude alan i mean the man was trying to share <laughs> well, your, your analogy of the blob, two things, and I'll be done. Um, you know, they, they're coming for us, man. Um, you know, we're going to be doing what we're supposed to be doing, following scripture, following truth, and the blob is coming for us. And I think your uh, making light of all of this is really... For me, too, the only way to deal with it, because if I didn't make jokes about it, I'd be, uh, let's just say, a little on edge. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm having these crazy conversations with my daughters. They're like, what the heck? You know, because they know what's going on. They have discernment. Not only do they have discernment, but they can see what's happening is not good. And they're like, they're like tripping out because it's like, you told us this was going to happen. It's like, it's happening. And it freaks me out to look out the window and see that it's happening, you know? Yeah. The blob. Hey. So that, who, who, who could guess that the blob was prophetic? <laughs> what kind of prophetic utterance did you have the other night, Alan? The blob. Steve McQueen. <laughs> right? Oh my gosh. Crazy stuff. All right. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. Who's next? Who's going to take this opportunity to bless everyone listening tonight? <laughs> Who wants the blessing? Okay, full of volunteers. I see how it is. I bet Leanne would have something to share. I don't have anything to share, but I... I, I did have a question, but... I wasn't going to ask it, but since we're in Ezekiel, can I ask a question regarding Ezekiel? Absolutely. I just... All right. So I was reading in Ezekiel 45. I was going to guess Ezekiel. And, and um, there's a part here where it talks about... Uh, hold on a second. In the uh, Ezekiel 45, verse 18. Um, in, in the first month, on the first of the new moon, you are to take a young bull, a perfect one, and shall cleanse the set-apart place. So leading up to this, he was talking about the princes and what they need to be doing. Not, it, I noticed that there was like a 
differentiation because he had been talking to the priests and then he's talking about my princes. They won't uh, oppress my people anymore, that sort of thing. I, I guess that's the first time I've ever noticed that there was anything unique that needed to be done on the first day of the biblical year. So it's the first like, day, it's the first day of a bib on Rosh Kodesh and there's a bull sacrifice involved. Yeah. So that's not actually in Leviticus 23. It's not actually a thing. So it must be something that they were used to doing traditionally. It was maybe part of their uh, religious tradition of some sort. Because okay. it's not actually in the scripture to do that. It's not in the, one of the feasts. Because if it was, it'd be in my book. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, it, it says, thus said the master Yahovah, or that's, that's how it is in this version. And then it's in quotes. It says in in the first month. So, can you read the whole? Can you read? Uh, can you put that one verse in context? So, are you saying that God told him to do it? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Yeah, God right. said the math, Yahovah in the first month on the first of the new moon, you are to take a young bull, a perfect one, and shall cleanse the set apart place. And then um, the priest is supposed to take some of that blood of the sin offering and put it on the doorpost of the house and on the four corners of the ledge of the slaughter place and on the posts of the gate um, of the inner courtyard. And then he goes on to say to do the same thing on the seventh of the, of the new moon for anyone who makes a mistake or is foolish. And you're supposed to make atonement for the house. And then he gives the instructions regarding Passover. I, I just was like, it right. just jumped out at me that that was like the first day of the right. year. So all well, the first years coming up. Right. And so I'm like, hey, are we supposed to be doing anything? Yeah. So. so so it looks like it's a it's a pre-Passover ritual cleansing. Yeah. A little bit of feast of of Day of Atonement is in there as well. Yeah. Um. They they are in Babylon, aren't they? Still at this point. I think so. And and but it's not an actual mandated observance or instruction. So it sounds like it's just something he's telling him to do. Does it say what year it was? Um, because it doesn't end with perpetual, uh, with all uh, perpetual right, in all right, your right. generations, right? Right, 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 right. I I know what you're talking about. No, I haven't seen that. I mean, and I need to go back. Because honestly, this kind of just picked up from, uh, it was like um, a, a Torah reading for the week. Right. And I felt like it just kind of picked up. And I'm like, well, I feel like I need to go back and Yeah, it's really a good one. It's an excellent awesome. question. And, and it, but it sounds like it's just something they were supposed to do at that point. It's not like, again, it's not in Leviticus. But even if it was, we're not, none of us are Levites. Yeah. And we can't sacrifice anything. Yeah. But apparently okay. Israel was supposed to do something on that day of that month in that year for cleansing. It's, 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 it's very, very similar to, to uh, atonement. Yeah, that's what I thought. I just had never and a, noticed. And a Passover precursor because they're putting it in the doors of their homes. Yeah. yeah. It's, com it's like a combination of both almost. Yeah. Well, it does say the holy place though. Yeah, it so does. When they go back to the land, as I understand it, they had maybe because of these abominations they saw, they had to cleanse the holy place and the place where they offered the sacrifices, almost like a rededication. Yeah. Yeah, because when I they did to... when they did go back, remember they had to rebuild the walls and they had to rededicate the, the temple and the altar and all that stuff. All right, so are we thinking that that's when that is? Or or I also, as I read it too, I thought, well, okay, wait a minute. Is this what somehow where we get some of this cleaning out things? I mean, obviously, the getting rid of the yeast. I understand yeah. that. But I mean, is, did that kind of go along with, hey, we're cleaning the temple too? Yeah. Which we also yeah. see or hear about uh, with the Maccabees. So it's a yeah. legit question. Our, well, thanks, Jason. our teacher, that, our that teacher, uh, I'm sorry, what? I said, thanks, Jason. That, that was my thing. I did have something sitting here, but I'm like, oh, well, we're in Ezekiel. Our, so, our okay. teacher Frank's jumping on the bit, isn't he? Look at him. Frank wants to go, Rawr. he wants to come out and say something. 
But Frank. one one quick comment. I mean, if they if they were coming back in at a, at a point where they had missed out on the Day of Atonement, it's I mean it, it it's possible. I'm not saying with any kind of authority that this would be the case, but you know, it, Michael Heiser in speaking of Leviticus that a great deal of the sacrifices aren't about sin. It's about making a place that he will dwell in. Mm -hmm. And so if the flavor of atonement is in these acts, it could very well speak to that purpose was that it would be that it would so that he would be in or have a place to dwell in and they could then start the proper practice of, of observance. So, I mean, that's se well, seems like it might be a... tonight. What we talked about tonight though, also speaks to uh, there was a place where he could not dwell because of what was being done. Right. So, yeah. Well, would not, I think, you know, he well, dwell in those places. True. Yeah, and I think he, I mean, the, the translation is a sin offering. The better translation in Hebrew is a purgation offering. And if we're talking about purging the place, that would certainly line up. Oh. Hmm. Good point. But not purgatory. Um, Tim, how how did you get that it's a purgation? Do you have a... So, yeah, so when you study the Hebrew, I, I spent some time studying the different offerings. What the church calls sacrifices are really more of offerings. And when you look at each of the words, uh, Rico's talked about it a lot and other, other scholars, they talk about how the... <clears throat> because, like, you know, when Mary had to offer a so-called sin offering after she had Jesus. Well, that doesn't line up, does it? It's cleansing. Yeah. But, yeah. It's, it's that Hebrew word is actually better translated. Most scholars will tell you that hatat is more about purgation than atonement. And so, you know, it makes sense that especially with the spiritual principles of blood, that there would have to be a purging so it's not like having a kid is sinful. Um, and so the hatat, when you look at when that offering is made in the Torah, it's much more linked to purging and purgation and cleansing um, and restoring, uh, restoring than it is. Um, yeah, I, there, it, it really is a translation issue, and I don't know why. They've continued to run with those terms. Um, it's also like that same word is connected with the Day of Atonement. It's about purging the holy place, not so much atoning uh, in the sense of like, oh, there's sin in the house. It's more about about cleansing. Hmm. And um, do you have a specific book that you would recommend on that topic? I'd have to look. Uh, I when I was looking into it, uh, there was a number of sources. Uh, Rico Cortez, Wis, uh, Wisdom and Torah Ministries, he talked a lot about the different sacrifices. I know the uh, Yale Anchor Commentaries uh, really. Um, I'm trying to remember. Milcom Jacob Milgram. He, he really uh, got into each of the sacrifices and what they meant and and just how the translations are better rendered. Um, I'd have to check. I, I can post it on Ban. Well, thank you. We're just really hung up on this idea of, in the Christian church that all the sacrifices had to deal with sin. I know. And and it's actually almost none of them did. Um, so it's it, it, that's just a concept that has crept in that, you know, and that's where a lot of them 
oh, because of Jesus, all, all the offerings are done away with. And yet we still see Hatat, Minka and all that stuff being done in Messiah's temple. So, you know, if you look at all of scripture, it's a better context, I think. There's a Thank question you. being asked if it's because it's Rosh Kodesh. No, because um, there's the only Rosh Kodesh that's an actual special Rosh Kodesh is trumpets, um, Yom Turah. I think it's just it's just a side thing that God's telling him to do then and there at that point. Good question, though. Great question. Thanks, Leanne. Denny, any thoughts while, while we have a focus on you guys? Uh, no. Okay. Just, <laughs> just want to ask all the questions tonight. So, okay. <laughs> They're leaving now. <laughs> All right, who's next to share? It's Monday. And it is, it's a fact. It's a fact, Jack. All right. I guess a couple things that left out for me uh, when we were talking about Ezekiel, and maybe I'm off base here, but the way that the uh, angel marks those who aren't participating, it made me think of Revelation, where they receive a mark, you know, the, the people that aren't corrupted and that aren't participating. I, I just never really thought of that before. I thought that was interesting. And... <clears throat> I don't know if there's a connection there or not, but I think there probably is. The other thing that really bothered me <laughs> is the whole idea that we don't really understand. Um, I know I don't. The relationship of posture and worship. And when I was thinking about it this weekend, that we have our children bending down to get their eggs. In the same way that, you know, children bend down to get their gifts in front of the tree. I I think it's a bigger deal than we realize, you know, yeah. and it, it, you think about it, the Magi knelt before the Messiah to give him a gift, not to get a gift. And I don't know, it just seems like all this fertility stuff is just, I, I worry, you know, I think about, I think about the kids and the ignorance that we're acting in. I, I don't know. I mean, there's a there's a tie in there. There's a tie in. It's we're, we're just really screwed. We're just so screwed. <laughs> well, Tim, yeah. I think you're, I think to your point or your question, the spiritual nature of these acts, we don't we're we're still digging into it. We still don't understand all the stuff that's going on. With it. Yeah. Yeah, and I was, I mean, I, I heard a podcast on, a, um, well, I think it was actually on the Michael Knowles show. There was a, a gal on there who was a former witch, a new ager, and she was talking, she was a yoga master, and she was talking about how so many people don't understand that those poses in yoga are actually opening yourself up to the spiritual, you know, and, and, um, I don't know. Like I say, I, I just think that we do so many things that we're not even really understanding the mechanics of it in the spirit realm. It's something to consider. Um, and and I, I just think, you know, we're not being very mindful that we're doing these things and we think that we're doing them in secret or, or maybe we're just doing them in ignorance, but they could have greater implications. And, and then you, you contrast that with, I don't know why we feel like the need to improve on God's Torah, but people do this like with the Lent and crap. And yet you have so many Christians that will participate in um, that and they won't participate in the counting of the Omer. And then the three days before Shavuot, you know, they were told to consecrate themselves to get ready. 
And you're lucky if you go to a congregation and they say anything about the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday, you know, and on receiving something from God. Um, I, I just think that, you know, I know that I've really kind of, I feel like I haven't really ever grasped or done a good job of the Omer in past years. It's something I want to be more deliberate about this year because there is a sense of building that anticipation of receiving at Shavuot, you know, and that's something that God does talk about versus, you know, all the uh, yeah. co-opting of pagan practices to get yourself ready for, you know, their holiday that they invented. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just read a comment. We might have a, a Muppet on board. Um, I don't think Kevin's here, is he? Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the majority of stuff that goes on is, well, like we talk about all the time, the physical is a manifestation of what's happening in the spiritual, whether you know it or not. See, Regardless of whether you know it or not, regardless of whether you understand it or not, and regardless of whether you believe it or not, doesn't mean it's not true. And people would r much rather, um, you know, play the stupid card and the ignorant card and just do what everyone else has been doing for, you know, for as long as they know. You know, that's not called seeking out your own salvation with fear and trembling, in fact. It's the actual ap actual opposite of that. Um, so, yeah. So I guess I have to give up my hot yoga class from now on? Is that start what? with the mat. Start with the mat. I have another quick thing. You know, if you, if you don't worship the right way, you don't have near as many pals. <laughs> I have no friends. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. When you look at that Ezekiel passage, pay attention to how much physical is going on there in relation to these practices. <sighs> Turning and facing and kneeling and all that stuff. Yep. Okay. Who's next? Don't don't make us start picking on people. No, oh, man, I'm ready for an early evening. Go, go get some dinner. Oh wait, Cynthia unmuted earlier. I forgot. Hey, Cynthia, I saw that. <laughs> okay. Darn it. <laughs> I'll be quick. So, um, the word repugnant. You know, I've read this, like I've said, I've read this several times, and this section was so icky to me this time. I, I know, I right? Mean, I mean, I, I actually connected with the Lord and how he feels about it, and it's pretty icky. It's pretty awful. Yeah. And uh, I used to love Easter, you know, the spring and the sunrise and how wonderful it all is and never made any connections to anything that God would not like. And reading his word like this and having it refocused. And yet, I mean, it's, it's taken three or four times for me to get it. It's, it's amazing how hard-shelled we are with our imaginations and our um, uh, sentimentality with, you know, family connections at this time. And all of that sentimental stuff is is really hard to let go of because it's it's hard with family and 
connections with family. I see photographs on Facebook of my friends with their families. They got together Easter and all that. And I just go, oh my gosh, they're eating pork. They're doing this. And I'm thinking, I used to do this. And I never knew how much it was icky. Awful. And repugnant to my God. Yeah. It's very sad. Yeah. It's very sad. The masses believe that what they're doing is correct. You know, the Pharisees said the same thing. They thought the same thing. And, um, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you can sit there. You, I mean, I, I'm going to say, I, I, I'm going I'm to say that I think I did a pretty good job of explaining it, breaking it down. I mean, there's, there's no wig, yeah. wiggle room, and, mm -hmm. and you really can't argue against it. It's all right there, yet they don't care. They literally uh, but, don't but, care. But it's so, it's so I'm, I'm speaking of myself here, okay? So I, I opened my heart to Torah and new things that God was helping me understand, ancient things that were new to me, and and... I've glossed, I glossed over this icky section. I didn't want to feel this uh, horrible thing. It's you know? icky. It's, icky's it's, a good and word. And I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to. So I just thought, you know, I mean, I hardly had anything underlined in this section. And I want, and this time it's like, yikes. I, I'm just so um, brokenhearted over this. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it was tough. I mean, so, you know, I transcribe everything on a, teleprompter app and so I, I you know and i'm like going through this particular particular piece and i was just like oh my gosh how am i going to get through this you know because it, it makes me so angry because these are the leaders of israel the 70 elders i mean you know what i'm saying it's like these guys are they it's not the, that they don't know better you know, you can't say, oh, well, they're supposed to know better. No, they do know better. They were convinced that God was no longer looking, listening, or involved. And they decided, well, we're going to do this instead. You know? Yeah. And and so, what? anyway, and so it was really hard to go through again, yet again, live with all, all of y'all. Um, that's my, my Texan right there. Um. Because it's it is like you said it's very icky, and and when you get to the point when you get to the part where six guys are set aside to go and kill everything that isn't marked, the fact that that is completely ignored, overlooked, and but see yeah. but see but they'll tell you well. Because of Jesus, I don't have to worry about that. I've got the mark of Jesus on me now. No, you don't. Not if you're doing all this other stuff. You're deceived. You're demonically deceived. No. Your faith profile is riddled with demonic lot. deception. Why? Because I don't believe the way you do? Well, yeah, and I didn't write any of this. I'm just telling you what your Bible says, and you don't have the wherewithal to connect the dots. And they don't like that. See, the one talent guy doesn't like being told he's a one talent guy. Yeah. And that's what we're that's what we're dealing with. You know, but at the same time, my heart breaks. It's hard for me not to cry because I see faces. I, I, I have names and faces that coincide with this stuff, you know. And yeah. For some reason, the deception is really thick on these people. They, they, you know, if, if they even understand what happened to Israel, they can't or don't believe it could possibly happen to them. Hell, the Holocaust was 80 freaking years ago, and we're in the same cycle as that. And people aren't believing that this could happen to them or in their now. And it is... You see, I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, this happened 2,000 years ago. Oh, this happened 4,000 years ago. Let's bring it to reality. 80 years ago, this happened. Not that long ago. You know, are you in step or are you out of step? And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's terrifying. It, it's absolutely terrifying. Our numbers are really small.
I have to do some real searching in my heart because why do I understand this? It isn't just for me, obviously, but how do I make this part of my life? Uh, right. I'm living, I'm practicing the feasts and I'm reading Torah and doing Torah and what have you, but I don't think that's all it's for is for me. Well, it can be. I mean, it's for you to, it's so that you know how to worship him the way he desires, the way he demands to be worshipped. And these, deserves to be worshipped. Yeah, these people are, what we just read in Ezekiel, they're not worshipping him the way he demands to be worshipped. They're doing, they have their back to the temple. Yeah. They have Baal altars in the temple, Astra. Their full-blown paganism is inside their temple, inside their church. And the fact that Christianity can't understand, won't understand, are absolutely, completely, willfully ignorant to the fact that they have the same pagan altars and idols inside their churches. No, we don't, Alan. Okay. Okay. And it doesn't matter. I mean, Jesus was the living Torah, and he told the Torah teachers the truth about the Torah, and they didn't understand him. They didn't get him. They killed him anyway. The hardest part, the, the, the process I had to go through to be here today was not only understanding, but accepting the reality that the majority of the people I know and love aren't actually one of us. Based on the scriptural narrative. Because if, if, if 1% of what we're talking about is true, we just lost a whole bunch of people. You know, that's why I say, if tassels are real, if tassels are a real deal, a real thing, no one wears tassels. If eating matzah, if the covenant is made in the eating of matzah, if eating matzah for a week is a real thing, the majority of our friends and family don't do that. If Passover is a... God set up a way for us to memorialize the death, entombment, and resurrection of Messiah. It's in the Bible. And the majority aren't doing it. They just did whatever shit show. I'm sorry. They're doing whatever they just did this last weekend as, a, as their memorial. It's not the same memorial that God established. I'm really sorry for the SH word. But this stuff provokes me to anger it provokes me to righteous indignation what they just did the last 72 hours is their version but it's not the way god commanded us to memorialize it and we're the dumbasses for doing it the way we're going to do it It's 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 crazy town. It's just straight up crazy town, and they're going to continue with their Tammuz worship. They're going to continue with their Bell worship. They're going to continue with their Astra poles. They're going to continue in their paganism because they've been told, just like Israel, that this was the way it was done. Right? What happened when Gideon broke down, tore down the astropole on his dad's property? They wanted to kill him. The fact that hundreds of years went by in the Israeli narrative, in the Jewish narrative, in the Hebrew narrative, hundreds of years went by when, with these people not doing anything right. The hardest thing is to, is to come to the understanding that the majority of the people we know and love will never get this. 
They think they know them. They're content with where they're at, how they're at, how they do it, blah, blah, blah. You know, their faith profile is intact. But, like, like I said, I, 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 I turned it off, but let me turn it on. Like I said, I'm going to repeat this because this, it bears repeating. And I have post, posted this multiple times in the six years since I've written it. And it makes them so angry. It makes them so angry. I'm finding it. I look, I'm looking for it because I shut it down. Here, where is it? Might be easier Choose you this day whom you will Before serve. Before that, the resurrection yeah. of my Messiah yes. did not occur Paragraph on the before. sunrise of a Sunday morn to be observed with colored eggs that represent the goddess of fertility with an abominable meal of swine on a false Sabbath in commemoration of a demonic deity. That's how they memorialize Jesus. God is not mocked. How long? He's not mocked. But in the same way these 70 elders and these 25 guys think, God's not listening. God's not hearing me. I'm not being punished for doing it like this. Well, not yet you're not. Oh, but I promise you, Alan Aguirre, Utah, What's, what's the date? <laughs> uh, Monday, April 1st, 2024. I promise you, you will be punished because God is not mocked. Whereas the resurrection of my Messiah occurred on the Feast of First Fruits, biblically, the Saturday night after the weekly Sabbath, following Passover, biblically, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, scripturally, as instructed by God through Moses in accordance with the whole counsel of Scripture, not just some psycho clown crap by some Italians in the 4th century. Right. Right. Choose you this day whom you will serve and by whom you'll be represented. Amen. It's, it's disturbing. It's, it's cringy, disturbing. Mm -hmm. And, I, and the only reason why I get so flipped out about it is because I have friends and family that fall into this category. We all do. Yeah. We all have friends and family that we're weeping over. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. And they, you know, right? And what's it say about the Matrix? They will die to defend that their matrix you know and they'll and they'll punish and do away with those that uh, try to liberate them Jesus said <laughs> look, what, look what they're doing to me look what they've done to me they're gonna do it to you too because of me Because you know what? You know what's more important than the, than the scriptural truth of what we're talking about? Egg hunts for their children in church. Okay. Knock yourself out, man. Knock yourself out. Cheers. <clears throat> well, Alan, you just have to understand that's not what it means to me. <laughs> oh man gosh the stuff these people come up with is just mind-blowing and the, the oh, I, I I been, been christian dribble of uh last week i was feeling the uh the whole well the three days and three nights that's a jewish idiom for like uh working all day and night i've been working night and day like a dog that's just what it meant you just that's devo they're covering it. Uh, <laughs> working on the cold mind, getting on yeah. now, working on the mind. Woo! Ever did it now. It's but just the excuses yeah. that come up. It just, just, it's, it's amazing how, how they will defend it. Yeah. And uh, they yeah. will fight and die to defend their matrix. And then they'll, tomorrow, they'll fight and defend Sola Scriptura. 
Oh my! <laughs> exactly. You know, See, and just like, like liberals, let's, no let's freaking reasoning makes no sense. Right. So, why? Do, you know, I don't need your help, buddy. I can trigger myself. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all. It's your two to one is my favorite one. I just laugh. I laugh in your general direction. Gosh, this is a tough one, man. Uh, this stuff yeah. it just it pisses me off. Yeah. I don't like it when my God and my Savior are misrepresented like this. It just makes me really angry. Well, and the three days thing is so important, and they don't get that. Like, hey, man, it's three days, three nails, and one way to God. <laughs> yeah, I knew that. I had the same thought. But no, uh, the, the thing that killed me is that so in that scripture in the reading tonight where uh, Yeshua appears to Mary and says, don't touch me yet. I haven't ascended to the Father. Three days. He had to do the three-day thing. He didn't go and present his blood in the heavenly tabernacle until the three days were completed. And that whole time, resurrection onward, where he's popping in and out, you know, he has a role as the, as the high priest in the heavenly tabernacle, Melchizedek, he had things he had to do. And so before, between Mary and when he appears to the, the disciples, that was all, they don't, they, they're just glossing over that. They don't understand the sign of Jonah. I mean, it's three days for a reason. He had to complete that cycle to complete the death, to rise, and then to do his priestly work in the heavenly throne room on that altar, and they're just it just all goes over their head. Do you have any idea how exciting the revelation of the whole McKezeldick puzzle is going to be? Just that alone? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. What makes it tough is, here's what makes it tough for me, the amount of demonicness surrounding this subject. That man has just willfully and willingly brought into the equation. It's mind-blowing. You know, Jerusalem is one of the most demonic places on earth. It's his very heart. And that place is a freaking nut job place, man. It's just, oh, man. And they're running around, man. Starting with those guys, man. Killing. With implements of death. Those that are not marked. I want God's mark on my body so bad. I want, it. I want his mark on my life. And it doesn't say that the person wearing linen is an angel. I think it's Jesus, personally. I swear, if I knew what that mark was, I would carve it on my skull right now. It's so important. I think it's important. It's important to me. I want to be known by him I don't want there to be any confusion any doubt do you think it's the seal of the Holy Spirit well, I mean, it's a combination of all of that yeah
You got this, Jason? I need to go get a grip. Yeah? Okay. No, I'm here. Okay. He's gone. So let's talk. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and some truly uh, truly thought-provoking stuff in this section. So who, uh, who else has some thoughts on tonight's subject? That's extremely thought-provoking. Did I step on someone? Nope, it was just me uh, okay. trying to acknowledge you. Thank you. Um, it's been really hard to stay face forward because I want to cry as well. Um, I had a conversation with a friend of mine that's been a friend for like over 50 years. Um, her friends, a or her husband is a pastor and they don't understand why the church is dying. And I'm thinking, are you preaching the word? And when you're telling me that you're going out for your ham dinner and you're doing Easter and you're doing all these things, you're doing the same thing that the world is doing. Um, so when I see the differences between how we view the scriptures, this group I'm talking about specifically, like listening to Cynthia and Tim and you and everyone and Alan talking about, I want that mark of God. Well, we're, we're writing that mark. I believe as we live in the word that God, our, our lives are written in the, in the Lamb's book of life. I think that's also the word. Now there may be an actual um, mark on us, but I think that we're creating that mark by our obedience our understanding, our doing, because the other people that are around me that are in Christianity, Christendom, whatever, um, they don't seem to get it. Um, I don't know if they don't pray for the wisdom, they don't pray over the scriptures, I don't know. And not that all of us here have it perfect, because we don't either. But it just seems like I say things to people and it's like I get a really blank stare like what are you talking about they don't even know that part of the scripture exists let alone anything else and it's like it seems so above their pay grade and that seems awful to say because God said you know it's simple enough for a child to understand so what has happened to these people you know it's like there's a force field around them that they just don't seem to get it now, is that all of the sin and disobedience around them that, you know, um, we need that big hammer that Alan carries sometimes <laughs> to get through? It's that Second, uh, Thess Second Thessalonians thing, man. It has to be, right? Yeah. So it's just, it, it, it's saddening and it's maddening all at the same time. And I, I'm looking at my, I, I'm looking at my girlfriend and I, I'm like, I just see this, just this, this like, whoa. Um, and then, um, I, and I'll say things, I'll, I'll say small things to her, you know, like, do you know you're the righteousness of God? You're not, just not a sinner saved by grace, you know? And she looks at me like, and I'm like, uh, you know, cause that's all they, they think about is just this whole sin thing. And I'm like, okay, you wake up every morning and you just are a sinner then. Well, then what did Yeshua die on the cross for? And why are we celebrate, or why are you celebrating this Easter thing? I, I just, yeah, I, I don't know. It just boggles my mind, but it's very, um, there's so much compassion in my heart for these people. But then on the other hand, sometimes they make me very angry because it's like you just want to shake them and wake them up and say, excuse me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we all have family and friends that are like this. And, um, that goes without saying, but yeah, this is, this is, uh, I don't know. Do we, do we mimeograph this off? That tells you how old I am. Mimeograph. <laughs> do we mimeograph this off and like hand it to them and say, read this. That's right there. I don't know, but it's, 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 it's tough. I mean, 
Imagine how Jesus felt, right? I mean, he's walking around, looking around, going, oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, oh, my Father. I mean, right? I mean, he must have been, he had to have been tripping out. I mean, isn't that why he, maybe, is that why he ran off into the mountains by himself in the middle of the night just to go, ah! I think the most poignant, and if nobody's seen The Chosen, they, they need to watch it, but the most poignant thing is when he was, he sent them all off, and he knew what was going to happen to them that later dinner, down the road. They go, when they asked dinner. him, wait, are you saying oh, that we could probably oh. die? And he's just yeah, sitting there going, because he knows he, that everybody he, in that freaking room is going to die except for one. I couldn't handle that. I lost it. I, I just like broke down. I, could, I can't even think about that right now. But anyway, but that's like, whoa, you know, and we're kind of feeling those same ways towards our friends and family, which is why we're trying hard to, you know, break through to them. And my, and my friend, I said, um, I said, would do you think that your church would watch The Chosen? I said, like, have a movie night and just go get The Chosen on DVD or whatever. I said, because it's one of the most poignant things that would kind of lead them. They're Methodists. I don't know what Methodists do, but, man, they're, they're like, way far removed from the Baptists. And these people used to be Baptists. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So I don't know. Well, um, and I, I'm, I'm interested on, like, to that point on The Chosen, what does somebody who, I mean, I think we have – a shared experience that watching that show brings out. What does the average Christian who's read these passages, who it's, has some Chris, exposure to it? Christianity is a philosophical morality play. Right. And so it, it's just, it, they just move it over to the, under the heading of philosophy. It's not something that's tangibly real in their life. And I don't understand that. Because when I was 16 years old reading the Bible, all I could think of was, I've got to figure this out. I've got to become like these people. Somehow, I need to figure this out. And thank God, I was in a church that actually knew how to do this stuff that could show me how to do it. But right. it, might, it blows my mind, the percentages of people that read the Bible and literally have no connection with the text. I think about when Yeshua was limited and what he could do in Nazareth because of their unbelief. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you talk about not the church not having power and it's dying. Well, maybe it's because they don't have faith. And you need to have the faith that in God's word and in what God is telling us to do. And we're matching, but we're once, putting our trust and faith in obedience. But once again, and that's so hard. But once again, I think that's a philosophical construct in their mind. It's not like an actual tangible thing. Here, for example, I'm going to share this, but it's not to shame you. You wrote it. No one has taught us how we affect the spiritual realm or how the spiritual realm has an effect on us. That's what Chameleon Church is here. That's why we're here, is to teach you those things. To bridge that gap in your mind, bridge that gap in your psyche, your mental, your, your, your emotions, your spiritual, your heart, right? All that stuff to make that, that connect. Come to our Shavuot conference. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm not trying to plug a conference. No, I'm trying to plug a place where you can come and start being trained in how the spiritual effects and the, the, how, how the two work together because that's what we do at, at, our, at the conference. And if you've been to the conference, you can tell them that. It's not just me trying to sell something to the point that we're going to go to the, 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 what's it called, the, the mall across the street and do uh, you know, treasure hunting. I, I know that you haven't been taught this stuff. I know this. I know that the majority haven't been taught this stuff which is why we teach it, because I was taught in this stuff, and we teach it because we can do it. That's why we do it. That's why we, you know, anyway. But I understand that the majority can't. But it's it's so important. Oh, you're registered. Woohoo! Are awesome. It's so important, that what we're talking about and what you're saying, uh, Kaylin, because I don't know how you do this thing 
with any amount of success without these pieces. It's impossible. God is spirit, <laughs> Jesus said, the red letters. God is spirit, and God demands, expects, and wants you to worship him in what? Spirit and truth. Well, that's, that, that means they're together. You can't just do one or the other. But the problem is, the spirit piece has been regulated to this weird thing that, it, you know, and they have no manifestation of it, and they have no power or authority. Again, it's just a philosophical construct in their mind, in their uh, independent. And that's all determined by your denomination, how that construct is, is set up, how deep, how shallow, how wide. That's all based on denomination. And for some reason, they believe that when you get saved, you're baptized, with the, you're, filled with the, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when our New Testament teaches us that it's a completely different thing, a separate thing. It's... <sighs> oh my gosh. If you've been to the conference, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never been, please come. It's harder. To, it's hard to explain. You have to be there to see it because this is what we're all about. This man, we are all about this, and and it's like and it and, and it's from the get go. You walk in, boom, we're here. Holy Spirit, pliable. I am clay. Mold me, shape me. <sighs> And this is supposed to be your daily, every day. When, when, when Elijah asked the Lord, to, <laughs> trigger Tuesday, not Monday, right? I know, I'm with you, Kevin. And when Elijah asked the Lord to open up his servant's eyes, that was his normal. Awesome. So looking forward to seeing you, Kaylin Hess. And I'm there. I'm there. I, I, if, if I'll be up, I'll stay up till as late as I have to to, 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 to discuss these things, to, to, to explain, question, answer questions, whatever. I mean, it's more important that you come and get every, and squeeze every last bit that you can out of us that are there to, to teach, to show, and to as end samples. It's more important than sleep. Remember, Jesus said, can, "Can you guys wake up? Wake up, dumbasses, and pray with me a little while." He looked, "Do you not understand? Do you not see or feel what is happening at this moment?" Oh, he he looks, and then, right, I just saw the passion with my grandkids. Oh, he looks, he looks scared. He looks afraid. Ooh, hello. That's your that that was their first clue to stay awake and intercede and support. Oh man. That that was strike two, Alan. What did you know? Well, you used you used you used the word dumb twice now. What did I say? I dumb. Said dumb or dumbass? Okay, what's the second part? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I won't talk anymore. <laughs> Alan, Alan, we'll make you do a charity thing for every time you use um, coarse language. Twenty. That's not coarse years. language. <laughs> uh, you want to hear coarse language? <laughs> I'll give you some coarse language. No, I, I think I think we should just go no holds barred, but turn that into a drinking game. You know? Yeah. When, oh my gosh. When I no see when I hear somebody use coarse language, I feel icky, and I'm like, oh my god. But I don't. That's not coarse language. I don't. I don't think it is either. But if some people are offended by that, hey, meh, meh. then they're at the, then they're they're, right. they're they're in the wrong place, man. Yeah, I was. If, I was if that's what you're going to focus God. on and not everything else, you're part of the problem. Yeah, I, yeah, that that's me. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's getting tough to withstand this. I wasn't, I, why did you think you was you? I'm just talking in general. If I want to talk to you, Jason, I'll say, "Hey, Jason." 
Okay, fair enough. Oh my gosh, Christina makes the rules. It's true. She's not here right now. <laughs> so she pops out of nowhere. Did you guys watch? Well, you guys watched Saturday morning, right? Oh my gosh, those first six, eight minutes. Oh my gosh, my wife is awesome. It's the only reason I watch, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? It's one of the biggest reasons I watch. I love it. It's so funny, right? It's like our daughter, our daughter was dying. She's like, what is wrong with you? What is, well, the two old people have been left alone with a camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my it's, God. It's, it just is, it's just family. It's wonderful it to is see my family, family leaders be family to me. Yes. You know what? My kids can tell you that's been their life, their whole lives. <laughs> <laughs> Ask them. So all three of our kids will be at this this year. Our, our oldest will be here. So you've, none of you have met her. So, man, she's awesome. Pick their brains. Is it really true that you guys grew up like that? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, I have no doubt. There's, I mean, there's enough video evidence of that existing out there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. There is, huh? Uh -huh. Even, even ABC caught it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, man internationally renowned at this point whatever <laughs> that would be a major coup if we could get the other half of that family here oh my god that would be no that's not good though. those people are <laughs> that's bad oh yeah no. that, those comment sections are a trip for sure we could exercise them good luck oh man Yes, if we haven't scared you already, come to the conference so that you can meet Jesus. <laughs> yes, oh, yes, uh, and so, sometimes he tries harder than uh, than others to, to get you to meet Jesus. But you know what's awesome? I'm looking at the picture of you guys. You all, all, you all, all of you have a have a testimony from coming to the conference, and it's a good one. It's an awesome one. It's, that's and that that's that's like so it's so rad it's so rad it's so rad it is um yeah i i i highly recommend if if you if you can go make make take the opportunity make make the way there it will be uh, it'll be worth your while if anything uh you get a good glimpse into some of what's brought us all together uh, just in community. And that's really, as I think everyone is, is figuring out, that's pretty, pretty indispensable and, and virtually irreplaceable in our local communities. Yeah. So having this opportunity and getting that taste of fellowship that we know hopefully bring back how to foster that in others and how to to bring them to a better understanding or a more, more full expression of his truth in our lives. Yeah. Well said, well said. All right. Should we call it? Unless anybody else has something real quick. Hey, thank you for making me laugh, and um, thank you for your hearts. Thank you for your desire for the Father. All right, uh, we'll see some of y'all on uh, tomorrow morning. We have a thing called the Chameleon Church Show, 8.45 a.m. Central, where we have no idea what we're going to talk about, but we'll talk about something. Good night. All right. Thanks, everyone. Ciao.
The views and opinions expressed during our broadcasts are solely those of the broadcast producers, hosts, and or guests, etc., and are not necessarily the views or opinions of the Travelog Network, its sponsors, or affiliates.